Um, we just touched a little bit about um, being unmarried, and we talks about in services unmarried, and um, I titled this "Oh to Be Single." Um, we're in First Corinthians chapter seven. Yep, yeah, we're down verses so eight and nine. Uh, verse 8 starts with, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them that they abide even as I, but if they can, cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Heavenly Father, as we approach the more difficult parts of First Corinthians here, we'll talk about being single, um, being married. Um, uh, we'll, we'll touch on divorce, Lord, and remarriage, and Lord, it is never your will that people get divorced, but things happen, and men make messes out of their lives. And um, Lord, you have provisions for certain things. We have your perfect will, and that would be our, always our desire to do is your perfect will. Um, Lord, just give us uh, uh, your wisdom as we go through these scriptures, Lord. Uh, it's not my area of expertise. I've put much research into it. Uh, I may be able to preach this with understanding. I uh, just ask that you would uh, bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. So 1 Corinthians 7, 8, and 9 also uh, goes along with verses 26 through 35 towards the end of the chapter. Which says, I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for man uh, so to be. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But in if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And a virgin marry, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they have had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and that they rejoice, and those that they rejoice not, that they that buy, and as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. But I would have you without carefulness, he that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord, but he that is married careth for the things that are of the world. Uh, how he may please his wife. There's a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and for that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. So there's an instruction here that's almost never emphasized in churches today. Um, to the contrary, marriage is held forth as the most desirable state by far, and those who are unmarried are often shunted aside from the mainstream of Christian service. So Paul takes a different position here. Paul gives four reasons for urging believers to remain single. First, it is good to remain single because of the present distress. This refers to the persecution of that time. It would refer to any era for persecution throughout the church age, even today. Um, a, a single person can have nobody held hostage to make them change their message or to uh, deny the Lord. Second, it is good to remain single because of the difficulties of married life. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. Single people tend to see marriage through rose-colored glasses, but Paul is speaking about reality. There are troubles in marriages, although not mine. My wife and I never fight. We have no problems at all. It's, we're just rolling right along. Uh, there's no sorrows. There's no untimely deaths of children. Uh, the disappointments and disagreements in marriage, misunderstandings and conflicts, financial troubles, troubles the dynamics of living together intimately with another sinner, the difficulty of coming to one mind in decisions, the necessity of self-sacrifice, etc. The list goes on. So those are all things that come with marriage that distract from uh, service to the Lord. Well, the third thing is good to remain single because time is short. This is a reminder of Christ's imminent return, uh, which is a major theme of the New Testament and must be a major theme of every preacher's ministry, every Christian home, and every church. Revelation 3.11 says, Behold, I come quickly, and hold fast to that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. 
when Jesus says, come quickly, it says in Revelation 22, 7, Behold, I come quickly, blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Revelation 22, 12 goes on to say, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to, and his work shall be. Revelation 22, 20 goes on to say, He which testifies these things, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. So you know, when we think of the married life and how actually difficult it is to do ministry, the single person has the ability to go on very quickly and go out and spread the gospel, even more so as the time approaches. Romans thirteen twelve says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. 1 Peter 4, 7 says, But the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch into prayer. So Paul goes on to remind the brethren that the fashion of the old world passes away in 1 Corinthians 7, 31, which says, And they that use this world and not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passes away. So it is happening right now. The world system in its fashion is passing away and soon will be gone. Therefore, we must live our lives fixed and firmly on the next world, make all of our decisions in that light, including marriage. God's people must know the times. Paul is teaching great wisdom. He says here, and they that use this word, this world as not abusing, refers to using the things of this world wisely and properly before God and not abusing them for sinful purposes. So that's the, the time is short, and a single person can do ministry faster, quickly, it's more portable, um, doing, doing more work for the Lord. Um, for the time is short, trying to get more souls saved. Fourth, it's good to remain single to be without, to be without carefulness. Careful here means anxious or troubled or distracted with care. The single person can concentrate wholly upon serving the Lord, but the married must always care about his or her own family. It's interesting in this context to observe that the first four missionaries were single. Um, Paul was single and um, did, a, did a tremendous work. He would go from town to town, whether he had um, just his coat on his back. Um, we know that he went through many trials. He was stoned, bit by a snake, shipwrecked. Um, many, many difficulties in life that he did not take a spouse or children through. Um, Acts 13, 1-4 says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menin, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed into Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. So these men all went out as single men. They didn't go out as married couples. They all went out as single men to do the work of evangelism, to be missionaries, to spread the gospel. So it is probable that Timothy was also single, as nothing is ever said about a wife. The married person must devote a lot of his or her time and thought to marital and family concerns. Paul is saying that the single Christian is free from these obligations and thus at liberty to focus upon serving the Lord, that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. It's in verse uh, 35 of chapter 7. Paul, as a single man, could give his full attention to prayer and Bible study, and evangelism and teaching and discipleship and Christian warfare. He could travel at a moment's notice without regard for wife and children. When he traveled on preaching journeys for years on end and spent months in jail, you don't have to worry about a family. So the major decisions of life, such as those pertaining to marriage, must be made with the utmost care, because there are great spiritual consequences. If a believer makes an unwise decision about marriage, it can have serious spiritual repercussions. If a believer marries someone that is carnal, for example, he or she will be influenced by and limited by the carnality of his or her spouse. Even the decision as to whether to marry has spiritual repercussions because once one enters into the marriage bond, he is less free to pursue spiritual matters. And of course, you know, the spiritual bond is until death do us part. So, um, Paul assumes that a woman that is not married is a virgin in uh, verse 34. This is, a line with a, this is in line with a high moral code of early churches. In shocking contrast with many modern churches, Though there were instances of immorality among the Christians then, 
this was a gross exception. It was a matter of discipline. So um, kept virgins is um, not as common today as it was actually in the uh, First Church of Corinth. I know I read an article a little, a little while ago. Now, this is just a general society. Most high school seniors, 80%, have been sexually active with more than one partner by the time they graduate from high school. I think that's a very, very sad situation of where our society is today. Um, so Paul gave this instruction to help the believers not to hurt them. He's not making this into a law, but is giving godly advice. In the end, marriage is a personal decision that the believer must make before the Lord. But this is an example of how preachers must be careful not to make even the strongest preference into an absolute law. The apostle saw many compelling reasons to forbid marriage. He did not forbid marriage, though, because he had no authority from God to do so. Uh, verses 10 and 11 of chapter 7, it goes on to say, And to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. And she, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. So we're getting into a, uh, a difficult section here. Sometimes the waters seem muddied. We'll just have to take it slow here. I spent, I don't know, a week studying different commentaries, searching scriptures, and um, going through our um, Articles of Faith, our Constitution, and, and seeing um, what it says about marriage and about uh, service. Um, so it talks in this verse about depart. Depart means to separate. Clearly implied the separation is that of divorce. We find as we continue in this chapter, we will see God's perfect will and then God's permissive will. So the husband or wife should not depart from his or her spouse. It says that in verse 10, and we know that God hates divorce. Malachi 2.16 says, For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he, he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garments, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously. The Jews had treated their original wives poorly by divorcing them for no reason. They were practicing polygamy, infidelity against their wives, and they were not innocent. God's plan always has been for one woman, for one man. It is even included in the plan for godly seed for, Adam, for Adam's time until the present. So God's will from the beginning of creation was for one man to marry one woman and for them to cleave to one another until death and not depart from one another. So Genesis 2.24 says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now I always thought of cleave, you know, like the, that meat cleaver that the butcher uses. <laughs> well, no, obviously that would be like splitting up. No, the, the word cleave here, this means to glue, to adhere, to join, to stick. The Hebrew word uh, used in Genesis is even more expressive, to cling, to adhere, to abide fast together to follow hard after, to be joined together, to keep, to overtake, to pursue, to take. So it's, it's, um, it's the joining together, not the splitting apart. Well, Matthew 19, uh, 4 through 8 is another uh, section about marriage. And he answered unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a giving of writing of divorcement, and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffer you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, from the beginning it was not so. So we see God's perfect will, and this is talking about God's permissive will in certain situations. So Paul's referring to a general rule. The Lord Jesus gave one exception to this instruction, and that is for the cause of fornication. Sex outside of marriage with another, well, it would be man or, or woman, um, or vice versa. In our society today, people do a lot of wicked things. Um, Matthew 5, 32 goes on to say, But I say unto you that whosoever should put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced commits adultery. 
Jesus restated the principle of the law that, that immorality was the cause for divorce. Although it was not mandated, Jesus went further and said that if an adulterous woman under these circumstances is divorced and proceeds to marry again, she continues in her adultery. So just because, uh, you know, especially young married couples not getting along, they just, they run to the court and say, I want a divorce. No, that's, that's not right. And if they do get divorced, um, they should not be getting remarried. In the case of adultery, um, they have the right to get divorced, but they don't have to get divorced. Uh, Matthew 19.9 goes on to say, And I say unto you, who shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery as well. So God is never for divorce, and under very limited circumstances, he tolerates remarriage. This is never God's perfect will, but he grudgingly allowed and regulates the same. So, but there is no sin or transgression too great, which cannot be forgiven. However, hardness of heart will preclude repentance and forgiveness. So the root cause of divorce is that one or both parties have hardened their hearts and will not forgive one another. In any event, divorce has never been God's perfect will. So there are two parties in the case of infidelity. The innocent spouse has the option of remarriage, and the guilty spouse who remarries continues in her adultery. Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 2 says, and When a man has taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he has found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she's departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. So the wife here, being an innocent spouse, is permitted to remarry. So what about a situation where there's physical abuse? The instructions here in 1 Corinthians 7 would cover such a situation for allows for a marriage partner to depart. It does not allow that person to be remarried, though. If a believer departs from a believing spouse for some reason other than fornication, he or she is to remain unmarried or to be reconciled to the former spouse. There is no option given for remarriage in this situation. If there is a problem other than fornication that is so serious that one of the marriage partners leaves, both are to remain unmarried. Um, Alan, are you saying that if, if a man beats on his wife, you know, and then he's Yes, but not be remarried. But not to remarry. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, um, I would say that in any case, it's, you're not you're not supposed to be married again, unless you're not committed to big guys. Yeah. Yeah, I've done some reading, um, and I, I I've read I don't know, six, seven different commentaries, and each one has a different view. <laughs> um, um, you know, some say in the case of fornication that you can get remarried. Um, I, I heard a sermon this week, and it was talking about um, divorce rate in the country right now is between 45 and 50 percent. Second marriages is 70 percent. Third and fourth marriages, you're up to almost 90 percent. So, um, yeah, my, my best friend in high school, I was at his first wedding, and they were married 15 years, and... Um, his wife ran off with somebody else and they ended up getting divorced. He ends up getting saved. Uh, we had a best friend, two of us in high school, she was a Christian. She married an unbeliever and they ended up getting divorced. And my friend got saved and met up with this other girl he went to high school with and they got married and they're relatively happily married today, but what a mess. And we'll, we'll look a little bit further in just a little bit here. Um, so we look at mixed marriages between a believer and an unbeliever. Um, these are treated in a separate category here in verses 12 through 24 of chapter 7. It says, But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. 
A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou a wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou a man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? But, if God, but, ha, but as God has distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, let him walk. And so ordained an I in all churches. Is any man calling being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Any called an uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same, calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care, care not for it, but if thou mayest be free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's freeman. Likewise also he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. You are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men, brethren. Let every man wherein he is called there and abide with God. So in verse 12 it says, But to the rest I speak, I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. So Paul's not saying that he is ceasing at this point to speak by divine inspiration, but he is now addressing something that Christ did not previously address during his earthly ministry. Christ addressed the matter of divorce and remarriage between Jews, and therefore between those who profess faith in God in the Bible. But he did not address the matter of divorce in the case of a believer married to an unbeliever. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. So the first thing Paul says in this situation is that the believer is not to put away his unbelieving spouse if the same is willing to dwell with him or her. So some believers then and now have the idea that if they were married before they were saved, the marriage is annulled uh, in Christ and then is acceptable to walk away from it because it was done outside of God's will. Well, this is not a teaching of the scripture. Marriage is marriage, whether the couple were saved or unsaved at the time of the union. Simply put, if a man is born a born-again Christian, but his wife is not saved, and she is willing to live with him, he ought not divorce her. So remember that God made marriage for all of mankind, uh, and then he put um, some special things on marriage for believers. Um, and it's God's design that even unbelievers stay married. It's never God's design for people to get married and divorced. Um, I've worked with some of the girls I work with, you know, they've been married a couple of years. They spent $50,000 on a wedding reception and then all the other stuff that goes along with it, and now they're divorced, and they're still paying for the wedding reception and on to the next, you know, on to the next guy. So, um, well, verse 13 goes on to say, And the woman which hath a husband believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. It is implied here simply if a born-again woman has an unsaved husband, and he is willing to live with her, she ought not divorce him. Verse 14 goes on to say, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else we are children unclean, but now are they holy. So it took me quite a while to figure this out. Um, so an important reason why the believer should seek to preserve the marriage is that God's special blessing is upon the unbelieving spouse and children in this situation. So children in this situation most frequently spiritually gravitate towards a lower spiritual denominator in their parents. However, both parents, however, when both parents are saved, which is the hope of the believing spouse staying in the marriage relationship and are trying their hardest to live for the Lord, the children tend to develop spiritually both in getting saved as well as growing in the Lord. And that to that degree they become holy. So the, the hope is that the believing spouse will eventually um, have ministered to the unbelieving spouse and their children. Um, even if the other spouse doesn't get saved, their children are still under the gospel. They still uh, have a parent that's going to church, uh, is witnessing, um, and they're still seeing the gospel. But it's a, it's a joy when the unbelieving spouse does get saved. It doesn't happen all the time. Um, Another thought as we press on and work with families in our community and our church, um, the meaning uh, seen here comes more to light as we minister the gospel in broken homes and mixed marriages. My wife is telling me that some of the kids they have downstairs, you know, they have siblings. You know, some of the siblings come and, and some don't, they're older kids or whatever. But you have a mom who's living with a guy and the other 
six or seven kids in the household, if there's five different fathers in the household, and it's quite a quite a hodgepodge there. But um, the kids come and hear the gospel. Um, I, sometimes we've had you know, one of the parents get saved, and we recently one of the parents gets saved, and the spouse got saved, and you know, we're, we're working with them, and hopefully they will mature along. Um, but it's um, that is our ministry field today. No longer do you have the nuclear family, mom and dad, and two or three kids. It's it's mom with you know two or three guys, or dad with two or three girls, and you know, a bunch of different stepkids. Um, but they're the ones we minister to. Um, so it means that unbelieving husband or wife is set apart from other unbelievers in certain ways. So you have the unbelieving spouse in the marriage. They get to hear the gospel more frequently. It is explained to them more clearly than just an unsaved person. They will see it lived out in the believer's lives of their spouse. They are the benefactors of Christian charity. They will learn precious biblical truths from the scriptures that most unsaved people do not know. And this shines a great light upon their lives. So to have a believing spouse in your marriage is definitely better than having an unbelieving spouse, or two unbelievers. Um, and remind you that this is a, a couple that were married and one spouse got saved. It's not talking about uh, unsaved man or woman going and marrying a saved man or woman going and marrying an unsaved person. And God, God forbids that. He said, do not be unequally yoked. And unfortunately, um, young people are doing that today. Um, I've been told, well, I can't find anybody else. Um, you know, and, you know, as we look through, you know, what, what Paul is saying about the single, staying single. Um, in some situations, some of the individuals would have been better off staying single and serving the Lord more diligently. But um, I think we get blinded by society. Our society says you need to be married by age 30, have three kids by age 35, and uh, you know, grandchildren by age 50 or whatever. And uh, society has it all mapped out for us, but God's map is a lot different. So we see there's benefits for the unbelieving spouse in the marriage. Um, the scriptures that most unsaved do not know, and it shines light upon their lives. They are the objects of the earnest prayers of the believing spouse and of his or her Christian friends and church and family. You know, we, we have prayer requests all the time for um, folks to get saved, and a lot of them are unbelieving spouses. An unbelieving spouse who is married to a believer participates in the blessings that God pours on that believer. You know, we sometimes complain... Oh, the weather's terrible. Everything's terrible. The government's terrible. Okay, you know, it, it rains on the just and the unjust. Well, for the, the sinner, God puts blessings upon him because he's married to one of his children. So they partake of the blessings as well. Um, let's see. In this sense, the unbelieving husband or wife is, if you want to say, quote, sanctified. The same is true for the children of a believer. Um, um, not that they are... are going to heaven, not that they're saved, but because they're in that household of the believer, God sets them apart. Uh, also noted in Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians uh, 7, 14 to 15, it does not give warrant for the putting away of the unequal yoke in marriage. Like I was talking about, it deals with those who have been married before conversion and find themselves bearing the unequal yoke then. The apostle uh, Paul teaches that in such a case, if the unbelieving partner is willing to go on in the marriage relationship, then the believer should go on. And in such a case, the believer is assured of God's uh, interest in them and their children. Um, it is a delightful illustration of our God's gracious interest in our welfare and of those related to us as well. So what if the unbeliever is not pleased to dwell with the believer? The believers to let them depart. The believing husband or wife must not try to force the unbelieving spouse to stay. They can implore, pray, but they cannot force. And it's wrong for a believer to run after unbelieving spouse in a persistent way to make him or her uh, self-interest obnoxious to the individual through exerting an all-out effort to make the spouse to stay. Peace should be the controlling factor. God has called us all to peace. The believer must not allow himself to be overcome with the, with the fleshly anger and jealousy and strife that often attend such situations. The, 
The believer must keep uh, his or her testimony of Christ pure, even the most degrading and difficult circumstances. Mixed marriages and second marriages create special difficulties, and a believer that is involved in such things can find him or herself in extreme distress. The believer must show the world that he is a source of strength, wisdom, and compassion, patience, and wisdom, and courage that the unbeliever does not have. He must not forget the promises of God that he can trust. God in every situation. Romans 8, 28 goes on to say, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. All things includes even the most difficult of mixed marriages. You know, I've, I've worked with some friends over the years that have gotten divorced, and um, yeah, they weren't saved, but it is such a mess. Um, you know, what you do with the kids, what you do with the finances. Um, um, you know, my one friend, he had to surrender his uh, firearm collection. He had to give up all kinds of things. Um, he couldn't leave the county with his kids, and just a messy, messy. But God knows all that, and God can work through those problems. Um, so what does it, so what does it mean that the believer is not in bondage in such cases here? Does this mean that he or she is free to remarry? The Bible does not say. Um, Matthew nineteen nine says, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. So Paul says that Jesus' instruction in the Gospel of Matthew did not address this situation. He said the Lord did not speak on this. So um, he says, But the rest I speak, I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. Does that mean then that the believer who is abandoned by his unbelieving spouse is free to remarry? So one quote I took here. Um, I've been reading through um, David Cloud's book on 1 Corinthians. And he says, uh, when Bible-believing men come down on both sides of this question, he says, I, for one, simply do not know, and I would not therefore have the conviction to instruct a believer in such a situation that he or she is absolutely forbidden to remarry, or that he or she is absolutely free to marry. In the case in which a believer is married, which a believer is married to a believer, the matter is clear. In such a case, the believer must either remain married to his spouse or remain unmarried. Yet the situation wherein the believer is married to an unbeliever is addressed separately. Since the Bible merely says a brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, it does not plainly define what this means. He goes on to say, I believe this is a personal and private matter between the individual and his or her God. And Romans 14 goes on to say, we are not to judge in matters about which the Bible is silent. Um, so, um, it's each individual in that situation that has to, to work it out with God. Um, I agree with him. I, I don't see what the Bible says either way. So, um, I know people have been in that situation, and they've gone to the justice of peace, they've gotten married, and, and moved on with their lives. Um, but I looked at our Constitution, and one of the reasons we, we look at marriage and divorce is, is to how servants in the church work. So as far as pastors and deacons, they're not to be divorced or divorced and remarried. Uh, Malachi 2, 14 through 17, which one of the verses in our Constitution says, Yet you say, yet you say wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom I was dealt, dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion, and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? Yet he had the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit. And let, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith he that, that, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garments, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit, that you deal not treacherously. You have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, wherein have we wearied him? When you say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them. Or where is the God of judgment? So God is never, never wanting the putting away of one's spouse. Um, another passage in Matthew 19, 3-12, um, where Jesus tempted the, of the Pharisees, 
um, which we already looked at part of that. Uh, Romans 7, 1 through 3 goes on to say, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how the law had dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which had abused hath... A, for the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband, so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she be married to another man. So that has to be to do with, um, you know, we, we may have a pastor at some point in the future that has a, a previous spouse that's passed away and he's remarried, and, um, and she's not divorced, or she may have had a spouse that passed away as well, and that's perfectly fine. First uh, Timothy 3, 2 says, um, pulling these verses out of our Constitution, as a bishop then must be blameless, husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. The same for deacons in 1 Timothy 3.12. says, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. That is 1.6 goes on to say, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. So the thought here is one wife for a lifetime. Um, back in Corinth, they did practice polygamy, but they also divorced one wife and they were on to the next. Well, now you have two wives. So... Um, our day and age here, people go to the court and they say, I want a divorce, and they think it's over with. But in God's eyes, marriage is until death does us part. So that's why it says one wife for pastors, one wife for deacons. Um, so 1 Corinthians seven sixteen, continuing on here. For what, thou know, for what knowest thou, a wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, a man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? So God's perfect will is to keep a marriage together, saved or unsaved or mixed. The thought here is that the believing spouse will give testimony to the unbelieving spouse and over time may come to know Christ as their Savior. Paul is not indicating here that the believing spouse does the saving, but rather through their witness and influence their mate may get saved. Um, verse 17, uh, working through the chapter here. That's the last uh, verse for tonight we'll go through. It says, But as God has distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordained I in all the churches. So in whatever situation God has called us, we ought to be content. Um, uh, the greater illusion Paul presents here is the broader question of marriage. He's implying that if God... Uh, if God has imparted one to live single, a single life, so do it. If God has called one to marriage, then so do it as well. And he goes on to say, and so ordained in all the churches. So Paul directs the same principles to all the churches and not singling out the Corinthian church. But that includes all the New Testament churches then and now and down through the ages. So uh, an overview of marriage and divorce and unbelieving uh, spouses and being single, um, a lot to figure out, and I'm not saying I'm an expert on it. Um, you know, some of the remarriage parts there, I am not an expert on. Um, that's why we also have a pastor. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't go to Bible school. I know from myself, um, my wife and I strive hard uh, in our marriage before God. Um, you know, we have we have difficulties. Um, we both get angry. My wife is Irish. I'm Scottish, and you know, it's, it's sometimes mixing fire and gasoline. But um, we've learned over the years to uh, take a breath and uh, take a rest for a while. We'll come back to the topic. So, um, and uh, we've both matured over the years as well, um, as uh, I hope all couples do. We have uh, several young couples in the church. I think we should try and be to encouragement to them as much as possible. Um, our society today is not a friend of marriage. It's a uh, wicked, wicked place out there. The devil seeks constantly to tear marriage apart. We've seen, um, we've seen the definition of marriage change. Now it can be a man and a man, a woman and a woman, or whatever flavor in between. And that's not the definition of marriage, um, not at all. Um, but as we go forward, we're going to be, you know, dealing with people that have um, 
messed up their lives at a younger time and now they're saved you know they may have you know two two other spouses or you know a bunch of kids by a bunch of different parents and um the bible gives us some direction how to how to work with folks um you know how, what areas they can serve in um uh, our church only calls out two things um pastor and deacon um and all of our deacons are trustees too so the, the role of trustee as well um, but the other areas of service in the church are open to people that have had difficulties in life and uh, have been remarried and um, I, I encourage those people to serve right alongside folks who have been married for the last 50 years because um, um, God didn't give any I know some churches don't want divorced people doing anything in the church and that's not right um, people have moved on in their lives obviously if, if people are um, flagrantly sitting in their life you know besides being divorced or married well that would be something that we have to be dealt with at the time but um, you know, I, I encourage folks that have been divorced or married to go on serving the Lord um, just can't be a pastor or a deacon that's it well um, hopefully we'll finish up chapter 11 um, I might preach something different next week because uh, we have no kids club and um, folks coming upstairs here will be coming in the middle of chapter 7 having no idea what's going on so I might do just a topical uh, sermon next week we'll, we'll see how that works out um, pray for me I, I do not have enough time in the day to, to get stuff done um, um, I did a little bit of this sermon um, during my lunch break at work and then trying to between my, my periods I sleep at home trying to grab some commentary and read it um, we, were, we were going someplace the other day I, I put a sermon on in the car while we were traveling listen to that and uh, it's, it's a lot to go through uh, but I'm not an expert at it um, I wish Roland was here because he's <clears throat> got a better understanding of it than I do but um, you had a question Yeah. As she's like, or young as Rachel, of this, you know, entering heaven. No, is um, Bob still alive? Pardon? Is Bob still alive? Yeah, uh huh. No, they were living with their daughter, right? She's, she's 96, and he's like, where's the county? Yeah. I just, I just, yeah. you know. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. Oh. I, I love both of them. Bob, Bob was a deacon with us for a while at Calvary, and he's a good man. Now, there's a, there's a couple that both their spouses died. Yep. And they found each other. You know, and they were married for 30 years. And they found each other. Well, you, you, want, you want to marry a believer, and you find believers in churches, in, in Bible believing churches. Um, yeah, I mean, some. Uh, I'm really up in the air over the the Christian dating sites. I'm not impressed with them. I, I know some people have found spouses that way. It's just not. I think going to churches and meeting folks, and or you, you may have a relative that's saved, it's single, and you, you know, you hear somebody over here, somebody single, and you, know, you, you put the two together, those type of things, and God works those things out, but. Well, let us close in prayer here, and I'll pray for Rita there, too. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word, Lord.